Stage one, setup. Stage two, new situation. Stage three, progress. Stage four, complications and higher stakes. Stage five, final push. And stage six, aftermath. Now this story structure technique was pioneered by Michael Haig, the author of this book, Writing Screenplays That Sell, link in the description below. And he discovered this framework after analyzing thousands of commercially successful films. So yeah, this video is gonna teach you all about Michael Haig's six stage story structure technique. But first, there's two things that Michael Haig wants us to really understand. The number one reason why we're writing a screenplay is to elicit emotion in our audience. That's your number one goal. And this story structure technique that I'm about to teach you is gonna help you do just that. The second thing he wants you to realize is that emotion grows out of conflict, not desire. In our stories, the more conflict your characters come up against, the more emotionally involved your audience becomes. Yes, desire may propel your story forward, but it's the obstacles that grab us and hold us there till the very end. Now, one thing you'll realize is that this structure technique is a bit more hands-off than Blake Snyder's beat sheet. If something doesn't happen on page 10 or page 12, it's not the end of the world. Michael Haig focuses a bit more on percentages, which gives us a little bit more flexibility with respect to where certain story events occur. Now, there are six stages that your story is gonna put your characters through. The setup, the new situation, progress, complications and higher stakes, the final push, and aftermath. And these six stages are primarily created by five turning points. Throughout your film, you're gonna have two journeys. You're gonna have the character's inner journey, and you're gonna have the character's outer journey. And throughout teaching you guys the structure process, we're gonna be alternating between these two journeys. Stage one, the setup. The first 10% of your screenplay constitutes what Michael Haig calls the setup. This is simply where we introduce our hero, we then begin to feel an emotional connection to our character. So this is the point where we kind of set up that outer journey that we briefly spoke about, which is what Michael Haig refers to as the journey of accomplishment, right? Which is that visible goal that they're gonna accomplish by the end of the film. Keep in mind that with the outer journey, the obstacles come from forces outside of the protagonist's control, such as the antagonist, how difficult achieving said goal is, etc. But with our hero's inner journey, the obstacles come from within the character. It will be a journey of internal transformation, from living in fear to living courageously. Now this becomes really important in our rewrites because as we are rewriting our films, it's important to track our hero's micro changes and how it relates back to our hero's internal obstacles. To begin, it's important to ask, what is our character's internal wound? So before the start of your story, how was your character hurt in some way, shape, or form? How has the past influenced your character? What is that painful experience in the past that your character think they dealt with, but they didn't really deal with? Because it's still affecting how they behave. Let's take Celie from The Color Purple, for instance. We witness her children taken away from her as a young mother herself. We see the awful men in her life who condition her mind to think the absolute worst about herself. And over time, it's not a stretch for the audience to assume that she's been weakened by a series of traumatic experiences we know she's endured. We know she's had her children taken from her. We know she's been a victim of sexual abuse. We know she's been a victim of full-on assault. What does that do to a person? What does that person sound like? And how does that person perceive the world? You must ain't got no kinfolk around these parts. All I had was my sister. So we see how her perception of the world has been shaped by her unique experiences. We should be striving to do the same things with our characters. Remember, the experiences that our characters endure inform our characters' beliefs and how they think. So in our setup portion, it's important that we clearly define who our protagonists are with respect to their internal struggle. Celie is afraid of sticking up for herself. She's afraid of fighting for what she believes in. Therefore, she's afraid of living the life she would truly be proud of. But hopefully, your entire story is about how she overcomes that inner turmoil and sets herself on a path to be more courageous, to live a more fulfilling life. This is all a part of our character's inner journey that we're going to map out in stage one. So our traumatic experiences give rise to our fears, which creates a false identity or persona. And Michael Haig refers to this as living fully within identity. This false identity was created by necessity because it's what our characters believed would keep them alive. It's what our characters believed would keep them safe. And in real life and in stories, we create an identity, right? This is the outward face that we present to the world. We're so afraid on an unconscious level that we feel like we've got to armor up 
in order to survive. This false self, aka the identity, is what we present to the world. Celie is meek, she doesn't want to ruffle any feathers, she's timid. This is all a part of her current identity. So remember, it's not only important for us to see what's wrong with this person, but it's also important for us to see how they've gotten there to begin with. And once we figure this part out, the rest of the story becomes a lot clearer. Now let's circle back to the outward journey. We should see our character living his or her everyday life. What does a normal day look like for our character? We show him or her living their everyday life up until a new situation happens. Turning point number one, opportunity. A new opportunity or problem presents itself to our hero, which brings us to stage two, a new situation. Now this new situation will take up the next 15% of our film. They're being presented with an event that takes them somewhere new, somewhere new physically and hopefully somewhere new emotionally, where they've got to figure out what's going on. Now perhaps they're taken to a new land geographically, and your MC, your main character, has got to figure out the new rules of this place. In other words, he or she has got to try and adapt to his or her new environment. Now, this stage kind of tells your audience where the story is going. Now the tricky thing about this is that your MC, your main character, cannot achieve their goal unless they step out of their identity, unless they step out of that false persona that they're presenting to the world. This is Story Mechanics 101, or what Robert McKee refers to as a part of the intrinsic muscle movements of story. Just like in life, there's always a catch. Can't get something for nothing. Ain't no free lunch. On an outer journey level, your film will be about your MC getting closer and closer to achieving their goal while facing greater and greater obstacles as they move toward the climax to achieve that goal. And this is where the dreaded internal journey comes back into play, right? This forces your MC to drop the facade or drop that persona, which is the most terrifying thing your MC could possibly do in the entire world, right? Aladdin can't steal Jasmine's heart without actually revealing who he truly is, without revealing that street rat he's so scared of showing people. So dropping that persona is the most terrifying thing your MC could possibly do in the entire world. You can have what you want, sure, and you can be fulfilled, but you're gonna be scared, you're gonna be terrified, because that armor is gonna have to come down. Or, you can stay exactly where you are, keep that armor on, and you're gonna be stuck living an unfulfilled life forever. So this process of thinking, should I stay where I am and be safe, or should I step out of my comfort zone and do what I really wanna do, that is internal conflict. The tug of war between staying in your comfort zone, but being unfulfilled, or bursting out of your comfort zone, but being terrified, that's known as inner conflict. Not only do you wanna show it, but ideally you want your audience to feel that decision that they're making is tough. You want the audience to feel the weight of that choice. And as for the progression of the inner journey, the rest of the story is going to track your character's gradual progression from living within their identity or false persona to what Michael Haig refers to as living in your essence. And your essence is your truth. That is your true form. Strip away your character's armor. Strip away the fear. And this is who they truly are. Now in stage two of your characters in a journey, your character is going to get a glimpse of what living in their essence feels like. They're gonna get a sense of what it would be like. Now this gives your MC something to latch onto, that glamor of what's in store for them if they play their cards right. Now in film, it helps to have a visible representation of this thing that is your main character's essence. In the color purple, the character that epitomizes this for Celie is Shug. Shug has it all, right? She's got the looks, the glamour, she's free to do whatever she pleases, she's got all the men in town eating out of the palm of her hand. At the end of stage two or act one, something will occur that pushes your MC closer towards their visible goal. This something is turning point two, change of plans. Stage three, progress. Ooh, it's not just chocolate, is it? There's marshmallow. This takes up the next 25% of your screenplay. This is the portion of your screenplay where your MC is gonna start pursuing their end goal without a shadow of a doubt. The MC will declare it with their mouth and start pursuing a specific finish line that they wanna reach by the end of the film. Now just remember, as your hero takes strides towards their goals, they are finding the courage to fulfill their dreams and concepts 
places, people, things that they encounter on the way. By this point, your character has a clear visible goal that's gonna lead your audience straight to the climax. They start going after the goal. And this is where your MC starts encountering more and more conflict. More and more obstacles starts to stand in your MC's way. Now the obstacles could be forces of nature like we saw in 2012, Day After Tomorrow, Moonfall. It could be from dark entities like we saw in Talk To Me. They could also be from other characters like we've seen in Color Purple. But in this stage, obstacles are gonna start appearing. And here's where your audience is really gonna get a sense of who your character really is. Nothing brings out true character like conflict. So your character formulates a plan and the plan seems to work as the obstacles in the story get greater and greater. Now at this stage, something very important happens on your character's inner journey. The identity or false persona that your character created in order to keep themselves safe from insecurities, from too much emotional risk, etc., is going to have to start coming down. Why? Because this is one of those storytelling rules that we simply cannot break. We never accept something in film when a character receives something for nothing. It's even got a name. It's called an ex machina. And it's frowned upon in the storytelling world because we know as human beings, we work really, really, really hard to get everything that we have. And so, the audience is not going to accept that that character was simply given what they needed without great sacrifice. If that doesn't happen, we as the audience, we're gonna be watching the film like, uh, ain't no way. Now to recap, the rule is, your character cannot make progress towards their goal without coming into their essence or their true self. And that involves stepping out of their false persona. In regards to that inner journey, they're gonna have to drop that armor if they wanna get closer to their goal. And of course, the problem with dropping their armor is that it terrifies your MC emotionally. They feel naked. Unless you're creating a tragedy where your MC ultimately dies at the end because of the poor choices that they've made, like what occurs in Roman J. Israel, Sinister, or Talk To Me, they they must follow this age-old storytelling rule. In stage three of your character's inner journey, they're gonna alternate between their identity or false persona and their essence or true self. What does that look like, Alan? Well, it's different for every story, right? What does that look like for the Beauty and the Beast? Well, we know that the Beast's essence is soft, is a human, is tender, is vulnerable, is not a beast. But the Beast's identity is this angry, vicious, creature. So in Beauty and the Beast, he alternates between this angry, vicious creature and this vulnerable, awesome, lovable human being. But the idea behind this part is the characters dipping their toe in the water, but they're not fully submerged in their essence yet. Maybe the experience gets a little too real for them when they start exposing their hearts, so they then retreat because it's way too scary for your MC to stay exposed. They're questioning rather or not they should be stepping into their essence. Let's take Wonka for instance. Willie's essence is that he's the greatest chocolatier who's ever lived, right? And Wonka, right before stage three, Willie's contemplating how he's gonna pay to free himself and noodle from servitude because he cannot be the greatest chocolatier of all time if he's enslaved. Stage three actually begins when Willie gets that light bulb moment, when he figures out a plan on how he's gonna be set free. In this stage, progress follows the execution of that plan. Or in one of my favorite films, Interstellar, stage three begins when Cooper finally decides he's going into outer space and leave his daughter on Earth. Cooper's essence is to literally become the savior of humanity. But Cooper cannot fully step into his essence, savior of humanity, without fully sacrificing his identity being a father. This is one of Cooper's biggest internal conflicts, leaving his daughter for the good of mankind. But even at this stage, stage three, Cooper hasn't really accepted the fact that he may need to let go of the time he'd have with his daughter for a greater purpose. Haig says the hero vacillates or alternates between identity and essence in stage three until we hit the midpoint, stage four. Stage four. Complications and higher stakes. This is where your hero's gonna face fear face to face. Boom, they've gotta confront it. Boom, 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 boom. Audience feels the fear because the main character feels the fear. Stuff's getting real, really real. This is the midpoint. The point of no return or turning point three. One of the best moments of cinematic history in my opinion, was the point in Interstellar where he is literally watching his 
kid's age before his very eyes. I was ugly crying at that point. I, I, was, I was just gone. So the beginning of stage four occurs when something happens that demands of our character to make an even bigger sacrifice. And this sacrifice is the biggest sacrifice that they've ever made. Hake says they make an even bigger commitment to their outer goal. Bear in mind how painful these experiences are, right? Your characters are pushing themselves out of their comfort zones or being pushed out of their comfort zones throughout the story. But this is the point where the story commands their full commitment to the outer goal. You know when I said in stage three, they're kind of just dipping their toe in, right? But here, something's going to occur that demands of them that they fully submerge themselves in their essence. They're going to deploy every thing at their disposal towards achieving their goal. And that beautiful emotion in our films comes from the sacrifices that our characters are making and comes from the external manifestations of our fears being realized right before our characters' very eyes. And we as the audience are experiencing these fears with them. Fear face to face. We're seeing our fears come to life. Haig says that the outside world closes in on our characters. And what happens there on the outer journey level is the obstacles are gonna get bigger and bigger. It's almost like God is saying, or the writer who is God over these characters is saying, okay, I think it's great you made this full commitment to your goal, now let's put it to the test. And so the obstacles will start coming faster, closer together, get bigger and bigger, and this is key for someone writing a screenplay. What needs to happen is the outside world needs to start closing in on your hero. More is at stake because your MC put more on the line. And as your MC seemingly put all of their cards on the table, that end goal becomes even that much harder to accomplish. Because that new situation, that new landscape they thought they acclimated to, begins to change again. On the outer journey level, after you crossed the midpoint in your story, the obstacles get bigger and bigger. The environment begins to tighten its grip around your MC. Like entering a lion's den, your MC reaches turning point four, the major setback. So those bloodthirsty creatures surrounding your MC forces your MC to seemingly fail at the major setback. Remember here, your hero appears to have failed to reach their end goal. The original plan that would lead your MC straight on to the promised land is gone. That plan's out the window. The worst possible thing that could happen, happens. Maybe someone died. It must seem to your audience that the bad guys won. Your audience must feel like all is lost or that they're never gonna come back from this blow. I don't know if you remember, this is the point in The Dark Knight Rises where Bane breaks Batman's back. Someone dies or something catastrophic happens. So on an inner journey level, what does that look like? Our hero will retreat back into their identity. They're gonna go back into that false persona, the place that they are emotionally shut down, where they're emotionally unavailable, that same place that they were at at the beginning of the story. Here, they may regret everything that they did that brought them to that point. They're like, oh, that was stupid. What was I thinking? They sulk in sadness. They're thinking they should have never risked anything emotionally. You get the idea. But if this is a tragedy, many of these points are inverted. So if this is a tragedy, this is the point where they would seemingly get everything that they wanted. They'll beat the bad guy. Or in Sinister, this is the point where they actually leave the house, they get out of danger, and they move to another house. They get everything that they desired, but they eventually die in the climax as a result of not doing what they should have. Not to say your character cannot die in the climax and still have done everything that he or she was supposed to have done, but that's more of a hero sacrifice and not a tragedy, right? That's a little different. Like we're not talking about what happened at the end of Man on Fire, where the hero ultimately sacrifices himself to get the end goal. We're talking about a traditional tragedy where the main character does not do what he's supposed to do all throughout the film. And he's kind of getting tastes of his essence, but he's not really doing anything substantial to step in to that essence. So he eventually dies at the climax. Why? Well, because he's not doing what the voice of God you are God of the story that you are creating. Your characters weren't listening to what you as the God of the story have been nudging them to do all along. In Haig's words, they lean into their identity 
throughout the entire movie until it literally kills them or prevents them from achieving their dreams. But if it's not a tragedy, as a result of getting knocked down, they retreat into their identity. And they go back home to the life that they were living at the beginning of the film, so to speak. They're back at square one. They appear to have lost. They appear to have given up on that end goal. But that doesn't work because at this point they're in too deep, right? Someone's life is on the line. There's too much at stake or they become inspired by one tiny little detail that you put in the setup of act one that re-emerges or resurfaces here in this stage. Now this tiny little detail is something that they may have overlooked. And remember, you bake this in to act one of your story. Or they become inspired by something that resurfaces. But now that tiny little detail that they overlooked in act one is one of the things that propels them to the story's climax. Doesn't matter what it is. One of these things, right, acts as the final nudge in the MC's life to encourage him or her to try one more time. They make one more do or die final push, which brings us to stage five, the final push. Now this is where the hero faces the villain for the very last time. We're in the color purple, it's that dining room scene where Celie confronts her husband at the dining room table, or the hero steps over that final hurdle to win the love interest. Now in action films, this is of course where you find that final battle. If the hero wins, that means that your hero is fully in their essence. This is where Haig marks that your hero's character arc is fully complete. And after your hero's character arc is fully complete, that's what gives him or her the strength to actually destroy or conquer the bad guy or win the love of his or her life. And the process of fighting or beating the bad guy at the end just proves that the MC is where he was supposed to be all along. But if they aren't fully in their essence, they cannot win because they simply don't have the tools that they need to win. If they haven't become the human that they were supposed to become internally, if they haven't conquered that internal conflict, they cannot win. Heroes living in their identity cannot win. Heroes living their essence give it everything that they have until they finally reach their end goal right here. Which brings us to stage six, aftermath. Now stage six is a direct reflection of stage one, right? where if you're looking at stage one as the before picture, stage six is the after picture. So stage six, the aftermath, explores life after the heroes completed his or her journey. The MCs accomplished what they had to accomplish. And we've got to remember that the aftermath is critical because it kind of validates the existence of the entire story because the audience has to see why accomplishing said goal was so important to begin with. We see our MC proudly stepping into their new life. And more importantly, we see how their lives have been transformed as a result of this journey that they've been through. So with respect to their internal journey, to circle back on that one more time, the stage one, we see them living fully in their identity. Whereas in stage six, we see them living fully in their essence. The only traces of their identity that remain in stage six is there as a reminder to remind the audience how far they have come since the beginning of the film. He or she is reaping all of the rewards of conquering their fears. Now it's not only crucial that you understand the outer motivations and the inner conflicts of our primary hero, right? But we also have to identify those things for our secondary characters and our antagonists as well. And I talk about that in this video. If you're interested in learning about Blake Snyder's beat sheet or his story structure method, I talk about that right here. What about Dan Harmon's story circle, Alan? Well, I also talk about that right here. You can also take a look at my feature length mini series, The Brotherhood, which is available on Tubi TV, on Hoopla, and on a bunch of other streaming platforms by clicking on the link in the description below. It's always a pleasure chatting with you guys. Until next time, peace.